So it is seven o'clock, so we'll start our service. Welcome everyone to the Oakland Center for Spiritual Living. It's our Wednesday night, um, a midweek oasis, we call it. It's an opportunity to uh, get together and, and see our fellow village members in between Sundays. Um, as you can see, nothing has changed out here in the parking lot. Everything's still pretty much the same. I'm guarding it and making sure everything is going well. Um, we have a wonderful theme for this month, and it's, I don't know why, but the home office tends to always have the perfect themes for us. Our, of course, our annual theme is 2020 Spiritual Vi Vision. And the monthly thing is living as compassionate conduits. How appropriate for what we're going through these days. If you're joining us for the first time, we welcome you. Um, I'll have some information about our village newsletter a little bit uh, later that you can learn about. We try to have our, our midweek service be an informal, intimate and rich experience some of our speakers speak and and teach and some speak a little and open it up for conversation and tonight we have the fabulous fabulous reverend eloise oliver she's minister emeritus of the east bay church of religious science she's also a former staff minister here at the oakland center she has a rich rich history with us in her bio i read online today it says she teaches that love and forgiveness is the answer to all human discord. There's no one that lives it better than her. So we're so, so very, very fortunate to have her with us tonight. Um, I, I'm excited to hear what she'll reveal. She held a beautiful meditation for us and even sang a song that her grandmother sang. Reminded me how one word can simply change your life. So. Yes is the word for the day. So thank you, Reverend Eve, for that little tidbit. I always get nuggets from everybody that speaks on Wednesday nights and something to take home. And, and that's what my take home is going to be tonight. So thank you, Reverend Eve. Um, I do want to remind you that as you join us, your camera and your microphone is muted. That improves the quality of the transmission. It doesn't do anything for my face though. So just, just know it's as good as it's gonna get today. Um, but anyways, I'm grateful that you're all here and we welcome everyone. Reverend Nee, if you would, I, I'm, I'm grateful to have you here. And it's the highlight of my Wednesday night career when you come to speak every other month. So we're so, so very blessed to have you with us. Um, if you could open us up with a, a, a prayer that would be lovely, and then we'll turn the floor right over to you, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I am so grateful to have the opportunity to pray. I always remind myself and others that prayer is never a solitary experience prayers like perfume you can't put it on yourself without getting it on others and so i'm thankful to be able to pray one of the ministers at our church at east bay church said i'm just thankful to be thankful and thank you is also one of those one words that my ancestors just used thank you lord Thank you, Lord. They would just say it all over and all over and all over so that whatever it is inside me that I need to purge from my mind, I can just say, thank you, Lord, and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work because there's something in me that knows what I need better than I know myself. And for this, I'm grateful, and so it is. And so again, I am thankful to be with you for another time. That 
Church on the Hill, as we used to call it, is my home. And I always remind myself that that's probably be my last step on earth is going down that hill. But tonight I was thankful to pray because I started to cry. And I realized that we live in a culture where crying is, is almost not allowed. But I think heart attacks and somebody said that more people die from stress than any other cause, although that's not what's listed on the death certificate. It stress shows up in, in your heart and in, in your body somewhere and it manifests as cancer, as this, as that, when it's actually stress. I bought myself a new pressure cooker yesterday and it, I read the directions for how to use it. And it has a few minutes, only a few minutes that you have to cook the beans in the pressure cooker. But when you cut it off, there's a little gauge that you have to let the steam out. It takes 10 minutes for it to cool down because what cooked the food was the stress that was built up in that pot. And so in our family, we've had a lot of stress this month. About a month ago, a young girl, a young lady that I had adopted as my great great granddaughter was murdered in Oakland, in Berkeley, in a drive by shooting. And we have all been totally crazy. And in times like these, we used to say, you need an anchor. In times like these, you really need a faith and something to hold on to. Because there are those who, who want to go out and try to find out who did it. And, and, you know, just a lot of anger and rage. And so what I know is finding out who did it and trying to punish the person is not gonna relieve the pain. And so I've been struggling with that. Um, and I've been struggling with the differences in people. And I said to somebody that I was not angry, I wasn't mad, and they say you ought to be. And so I want to be a person that can take action without anger, without uh, condemnation, without, and I said today that I know that I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I've never killed anybody, but not cause I didn't have the feeling. And when I, learn to read, I read the Bible, and somewhere in that book it says that to feel like do, doing that is the same as doing that. So I don't know how I could condemn anybody for hardly anything. But this is a Thanksgiving week, and even at the Church on the Hill, we used to have a testimony meeting, it was the only time that people were given the opportunity to just testify. And in the, in the, the old church, Wednesday night service, the midweek service was the service just for that, that you get to give thanks. And my grandmother would demand that we give thanks and she would roll her eyes at us and say, you better get up from there and thank God for something. And we would say it so fast that even God himself would have to try to figure out what we said because she would make us stand up and say, I thank God for life, health, and strength, and I want y'all to pray for me or something like that. And we would pop up like popcorn and we would say it so fast because we had memorized it because she had already told us we better thank God for something. But it set a pattern in my life for being thankful.
Hmm. And I am thankful. I um I used to, I read Kubla Ross's book about death, and one of the steps in that process is anger. And so we seem to be going through that now about who should take care of the baby because the girl had a child. And uh, I have my own opinion about who I think is best suited to do that, but I'm, I'm not, I'm staying out of it. And uh, the courts will decide and all that. And I don't think they can, the courts can decide anything because they don't know. But anyhow, this is Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving is, is actually a day set aside for just that. And the funny thing is before we all got together, we were talking about recipes and what to eat and what to cook and how to do this and that. And I remember one Thanksgiving, a preacher came to town that had a bunch of kids and tithing was not always money. It was 10% of whatever you had gained. And so we had a big turkey in the freezer, but my kids never liked turkey because the, the breast of a turkey don't have no flavor anyway much. So I gave the turkey to the preacher because my kids liked uh, things they could easily eat and hold in their hands. So they had turkey burgers or something. And my husband liked to have had a fit. When he found out, he got the, the carving set out and he was all just getting ready to carve the turkey. And when I said we wasn't having turkey, he said, what? I know I bought a turkey when <laughs> I went to the commissary and I said, well, the kids don't like turkey and I don't need them. So we, I gave it to Reverend so-and-so and so and so. Lord, that man must have had a fit. But it was funny to me because um, we didn't like it. And then there was a whole lot of stuff to be cleaned up. And that's what I always think about when it comes to all this cooking is after the meal is prepared, there's all kinds of pots and pans that need cleaning. And um, it's, just, it's just strange to me that we start the season thinking about food. And I've really released a lot of weight in the last few years. And I'm always conscious of it because we used to say, I lost it and I don't want to find it either. So I'm thinking about the stuffing and all the stuff that goes with it. And so between Thanksgiving and Christmas, which is about a month, people, I usually would gain weight. But Thanksgiving is something I feel that can make a person happy. I don't think you can give thanks and be mad at the same time. And so I think that if we went to bed each night with a pad or a pencil or whatever you write with, have it right beside your bed. And when you wake up the next morning, if you turn over and get that and start listing the things that you have to be think of, thankful for. We have a uh, Yaman Yah in our church and she likes to sing, something woke me up this morning. I, it had to be the hand of the Lord. So when we realize that it's really not the alarm clock that woke you up, because I try my best not to ever wake up with an alarm because it feels shocking to me. But if you wake up in the morning, that's number one thing to be thankful for. And you can find, if you can write 10 or 20 things that you have to be thankful for before you start your day, it will cause you to get along with people better because you're starting a brand new, a clean slate. And so many times we just keep the madness going. Whatever we were mad about yesterday, we bring it into the day and we're still dealing with that. But 
the thing, the book also says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't go to bed mad with nobody. Find a way to release that. Find your book, find your scripture, find something that speaks to your heart and work your way through that. It, it, now, I know people don't believe that. The first metaphysical book that I read was Everything Begins in Mind, and it was by Dr. Jack Addington, and he had been an attorney. He came to First Church. We, I was going to Unity down on Lakeshore, and my mother brought me that book, and um, he had a speaking engagement at Oakland Center. And so my mother, my daughter said, Mama, you know that man that wrote that book? He's speaking at a place called uh, Oak, uh, First Church of Religious Science on Clarewood Drive. And I said, I don't know where that is. And somebody said, well, call AC Transit and they'll tell you what bus to ride and they'll tell you how to get there. And that was the beginning of the East Bay Church because sure enough, I called uh, AC Transit and they told me that it did not come up there on Sunday. It came during the week to bring the domestic help. And I had been the domestic help. I had worked with my daddy to clean houses for people. So as soon as I got a chance, I jammed Dr. Earl Evans, who was a minister there at that time. And I said, you all got this philosophy up here on the hill and you can't, nobody can't get here unless they got a car. And the folk who don't even know how to get a car needs it. And I fussed at him and he said he understood. And when he retired, he would start a church on the bus line. And so he did. And so I've been an activist all my life. I don't set fires and do any of that tearing up stuff. But I've been an activist. I've been an activist for God. And I, I think that sometimes when I hear people talk about how powerful I am and this and that, and I thought, and you don't get like that without pain and suffering. You don't do that. But I've given my life to God. Oh. I used to say, I don't want to suffer. But when I die, I was like Kevorkian, and Dr. Kevorkian. and I, I don't want to suffer. Just give me something to drink. If I get beyond the stage of no return, just give me some pills and let me out of here. But I've changed that. I feel if my suffering can further the kingdom of God on earth, I'll do that. Because I know that I don't seem to see people who are willing to, to go through anguish for anything. I don't see that. I think that uh, it is my desire that every couple that's together stay together, especially if they have children. Because when I was in the youth ministry, right there at First Church, a young, a young girl used to write, I would let the kids give me treatments and I'd explain to the children about treatment and whatever they wanted me to pray for. And they'd scribble their little treatments and give them to me and I would pray. And I never said anything to the parents about what the child was praying for. And we were up there and one little girl never knew her dad and all the, her mother and her everybody lavished everything on her. Her mama did all the love, everybody did, we all did. And she said, I want to know my dad. I want to see my dad. And years passed and I had become the minister of East Bay. And that man walked in there one day and this girl's mother was upset. She said, why in the world would he show up here? Because I've been doing this and I've taken care of her and he didn't do this. And we measured everything in money now. I'm the one took care of her. I'm the one did this. I spent this. I sent her to school. I did that. And I said, you know what? You can't do nothing about that. Because that baby wrote a treatment 
many years ago and she said she wanted to know her dad. And she has a right to know that. And in my experience leading people, I see that money has... I was coming in and get something, I don't see it up front, so go ahead. So in my experience, I have no, no, found that it. money has come, become more important than love, than feeling, than health, than anything, you know? It's, the whole thing is, I don't care how much money you have, if you don't have love in your heart, if you don't have happiness, if you don't have joy, that means nothing. And, and even in, in, in politics and everything, it's, it's amazing that we talk about the food we eat and how the Food and Drug Administration is all in the same bag, you know. And if you don't stand right there and read all the labels in the store, you'll be eating some corn syrup and not even know it. And these are, these are things that people do to add uh, certain products to food that people eat that make people sick. And it's all about money. And I love money. Money uh, serves me and money it can be used for a great purpose. But this whole idea of money before love is just not makes sense to me and I don't even know how to say it because I say it to my family and they're talking no mommy you got to have some money well of course you have to have some money but money does not need to separate people and so if you write 10 things you have to be thankful for and all day long if you focus on thanksgiving it will get you through the day through all kinds of stuff. And I'm not asking people to do anything that I haven't tried myself. But this is the fall of the year. It's harvest time. It's time to gather, hmm, gather things together. And, and there's a time for all things. And as I say, one month from now, it'll be Christmas. And all these holidays, or holidays that were in place before Christianity. They were, people would celebrate the seasons, the change of seasons, and they would honor the moon and the sun and all that kind of stuff. And then we came along and we gave it different names, but it's still a day, a time of Thanksgiving. Oh. As many, all of you know that, um, I was raised in the deep south. My grandmother was a, was a full-blooded Cree Indian. And my father was a free African uh, man that lived in the woods. And of course he ran into her and they got together. And from there came my mother and uh, she still lived out in the woods. And when I would live, we lived out there with her. And I'm just thankful that I lived out there with her because she had a tremendous faith in God. And that's where I got mine. I got my faith from her. And she knew how to get roots and herbs and make teas and, and there was no doctors. And that night when my brother was sick, they wrapped him in leaves and things like that to cool his fever. And so I, I just know the value of prayer. I don't even know if the leaves healed him or if it was their staying up all night praying with him. But I know my brother survived. And, and I started to believe that my prayers make a difference. And so that same book that I keep talking about, which is a really crazy book if you take it literally, It says it's done unto you as you believe. And so even with the COVID-19, someone in my family has tested positive. 
And I said, well, they don't have no cure for it. So the same thing you're supposed to be doing all the time, you just have to do more of that. It, it just makes you take care of yourself better. That's all. Because, you know, you can survive it. And I tell myself the same thing because I'm in that age group that is supposed to have, it, it has this dreadful effect on old people. And I'm the oldest person I know. So they are doing the voting campaign. A friend of mine took a picture of me casting my ballot. And I said, I'm the oldest person that voted at that precinct. And somebody said, oh, I don't tell nobody that. And I said, yeah, but I'm proud of that. I'm proud that there's something that the Holy Spirit has left me here for. Reverend uh, Dr. Moore, another minister at First Church used to say, you'll know if you still have work to do if you're still here. So obviously there's something else for me to do because I'm still here. So I want to start taking question and answers because that's what Wednesday night service is for. So I'm going to stop right here. I don't remember what the protocol is for allowing you to speak, but whomever is responsible for that, I want you to, to say whatever you'd like to say or ask whatever you'd like to ask. And I will answer it from my heart. And that's how I do that. Well, Reverend E, what we do here at Oakland Center is for those that know how to use the participant button, they can raise their hand there or they can turn on their camera and raise their hand like this and they'll be recognized, okay? So if you have a question or a statement you wanna make to um, Reverend E, I see that Lucian Baker <laughs> has yeah, raised baby. his hand. So, <laughs> how's it going? Fine. Do you have a baby? Baby's right here. You better show it, or she's gonna ride you. <laughs> <laughs> In our new place, so everything is like everywhere, and my wife asked me not to do that, so I'm not going to. Okay. But I wanted to touch on what you said about stress grandmother and how it can be lethal and how they don't talk about how Amen. people die from stress and i just really wanted to touch on that and maybe talk about ways we can prevent stress from getting to that level in our lives well what i what i feel that every person needs is a prayer partner. We don't, we didn't always call it prayer partner, but people at First Church know that Ruth is a friend of mine. And Ruth has been with my friend for years. And she's a person that if she says to me, stop, I'll stop on a dime because other people can see me when I can't see myself. And uh, I think every, nowadays in our church, we talk about having prayer partners. And that's the purpose of a prayer partner is that when you have gone as far as you can go by yourself, you have somebody that you can talk with that knows you, that can pray with you and assist you. Because the, the, the same book I've been talking about, it says, where two or more are gathered together, touching and agreeing on the same thing, they can ask whatever they will, and it shall be done. And so I really think that's what uh, lovers and partners really are for. Of course, we, we get together on physical attraction. I don't know if that was the original idea or what, but that's what I think couples are for, is to be those two, be there for each other. And anytime you get two people to agree on anything, the book said there are there's no qualification. You can ask whatever. And Brother Ishmael is tall and big and African and all that. He came to this country and he ate like I don't know what because we had a lot of food that they didn't eat. And he had never seen a bean pie. And he ate a bean pie that he bought on the corner 
And of course, it, was, it wasn't fresh and he was very sick. And so all the practitioners and things we have at church, everybody was trying to pray for him. He was like, get back, get back. I want my wife, call my wife, my wife can heal me. And I thought how beautiful it was that we were all right there. But he said, no, I want my wife. My wife can heal me. So that's the kind of relationship I think that people should have. And I think people can have it if one person, If one person can surrender and, as we say, get that blow to nothingness out of the way and let God be God in their lives, I believe it'll work. I always tell my family, you don't have to quit nobody. You just pray. And if that's not the right person, they will leave. And if they don't leave, you got work to do. How's that? Yeah, it's great. Thank you, thank you. Next person. Is there someone else that wants to ask a question to Reverend E? Or to share. If not, she'll pick on somebody. <laughs> Uh, Barbara, Barbara's got her camera unmuted. Barbara, did you want to say something? Maybe they don't know how to unmute. They got twenty four participants. Barbara. Well, if Barbara doesn't have a question, I do. Okay. Reveni, what do you think about? Um, the mental equivalent in this. Um, a lot of times through prayer, sometimes we should not be out there telling everybody about where we are and what we want. What do you think about the mental equivalent in, in prayer? Should we just keep that with between God and I or should we tell a friend and does that disrupt a lot of things? This is Dorothy. I see that that's Dorothy. I don't think <laughs> I quite understand what you're talking about, the mental equivalent. The, um... Well, as you were saying that this gentleman wanted only his wife to be there with him, what about if we, as not just practitioners, but as individuals, have something heavy that we want prayer for, should we be able to express it to a friend, or should we keep that within ourselves between God and I? No, that we were talking about releasing Stress, that's, that's what creates the stress to keep it within ourselves. Okay. I, I, I was amazed that I, I mentioned Brother Ishmael's size and how big and tall he is. And his wife is about, look like half of his size. Uh -huh. He was in Africa and he was here. And um, what he wanted was his prayer partner. Oh, okay. And what he told us is that um, he and his wife, when they wanted to, to uh, manifest anything, yeah. that they refrained from sex for a period of time. And then after sex, that's when they would ask for what they want because he said that is the one time when you are absolutely free, you don't have nothing else on your mind. That's the time to speak your word. Okay. And when he told us that we were the choir was singing at Agape and we had rented a bus and he was on the bus going to Agape with us. Okay. And he said that Michael Spratt said, Brother Ishmael, who how you gonna do that? Who thinking about no prayer? And he said, Well, I guess you just do the best you can. And we fell out. <laughs> <laughs> 
that he said a man and his wife can manifest anything they want. All right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's that's why I say I feel like sex is a very spiritual act, and that's what it was meant to be. But because of our physical self, we put our feeling thing on it. And uh, it, it, it's way out there and left field, totally different from what God had, well, this is me talking about what God had in mind. But this is how I feel about it. I feel that it has become marketable, so to speak. And um, things are just different than what I believe. I, I believe that a man said to me one time, I married when I was 15 and my first child was born when I was 17. And by the time I was 29, I had seven children. So I saw an old man one day that used to know us when we were young. And he said, I used to look at you all the time. And then every time that man come from overseas, when he left, you was pregnant. And I said, that man ought to give his wife a break. And but I know all I can say is you was always smiling. <laughs> <laughs> and I laugh so hard about the quality of joy that I had at that time and how people looked at it as the most difficult time of my life. Am I making sense what I'm saying? And that's what he said. He said, Well. Every time I looked at you, you was pregnant, but you was always smiling. And I think that I'm again I'm talking about couples and the joy that they bring each other. Uh, if you if you don't have but a crust of bread and a, a jar of milk, whatever it is, if you got joy, then that's stress-free living right there. <clears throat> that's what it is to me. I know that uh, there was one time a Hispanic couple was, was documented where these, these people had all these children and somehow or another, they managed to get them all through co into college and they were all doing well. And it was a very big family of people and people just don't believe that can be done, but it can. I'm not saying that I was trying to have that many kids. There's so much, I hear people talk about racism a lot. I don't even talk about racism, but I experienced it at a deep level. Because when birth control first was, they found out different things for birth control, it wasn't even given to black women. Black women wouldn't, did not have access to that. Judith, do you have a question for Reverend E? Judith Roberts or Judith Ronglass? Judith Roberts. <laughs> um, Reverend E, I don't have a question. I, I, um, I just wanted to offer my condolences to you and your family at the, in the loss of your um, great great granddaughter. It was a very, very touching story. Thank you. And I, I know it's not a story, but it's a something you're, um, you're still, you know, you've, you're still grieving. And I, I just wanted to offer my condolences. Yes, I am. I went to my doctor and he said, uh, you need to experience your feelings because if you don't grieve now, it's going to show up in another place. So, uh, yeah. I don't, uh, I can't participate in who did it and why and all that. And I know that uh, this baby's daddy, my grandson is 21. And so people have been with him all the time. Somebody in the family has spent time with him. He's not by himself. Cause he goes from days, day, my, my 
my daughter said he goes from crying like a baby to rage and, and now he gonna gather up all his partners and they gonna go out and, and do something stupid but so far we, that hasn't happened and so in times like these like i say somebody got to be praying somebody got to hold the light somebody got to stand watch and um that's what we do. Those of us who have heard the truth, who know the truth, we have to be the light in the darkness. And, and this, this, this election time and all the madness that's going on, this is a time of darkness. And we must be the light. We must be the light. We must be the light. And it's uh, it's just that time that there's there's so much going on that uh, we just I read what a practitioner does, and so I feel that we are all practitioners. If you're on this call, you've been called, because that's what I believe. I believe that we come together, and if you in my life. You've been called. Somebody talked about, Dorothy mentioned the mental equivalent. And when I meet somebody, I know that they wouldn't have crossed my path if they didn't come to help. That in the country, we had to make a fire and you know, we had no heater and all that. And so we would have to put some wood on the fire to keep the fire going to keep the house warm. And so people who, who come through my life, they came to put some wood on the fire. Yes. That's all I mean. That's all I mean. I ask God for help. And God sends help. It doesn't always look like help. Help might come up and slap you. <laughs> what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> but I'm just saying that help don't always look like help. Help don't even know the help sometimes. Hello. Help don't even know the help. Mm -hmm. But if you came in my life, you came for help. Yep. And that's what the mental equivalent means. That if everybody I meet is crazy, then I need to examine myself. If I keep on getting unworthy folks, that don't sound too good about me. Because all I can ever find is me. That's all I ever see is me. That's all I ever meet is me. I don't care what it looks like. If I met it, it's me. We, in, 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 in religious science, we talk about there's only one of us here. There's only one this and only one that. And as soon as we had difficulty, we split. Now it's two. Because he over there did that. And, and I didn't do that. He did that. That's not so. Either it's the truth or it's a lie. I can't back down on what I said because somebody shot my granddaughter. No. Either there's one life. That life is God. That life is whole, perfect, and complete. And that life is my life now. That life is the life of everybody that lives. Either it's that or it ain't. So the fact that you might be acting what we call unseemingly, that, that don't mean that's, that you're not different from me. Grandmama, it makes me, uh, I remember the one time where you told me that anything that I'm complaining about means that I, I, it's bothering me because I'm the answer to it. And I try to always remember that, that if it's something that I'm complaining about, it's because it's my passion and it's something that I should, should invest myself in. And so I just think about that when I complain about anything in my life, 
it's bothering me because I'm the solution. That's what you taught me. Yeah. Well, I, I just, I, I think that because I had a large family and because I traveled all over the world following William, because I found myself in places all by myself, I had to reach back and get what I know. And uh, no doubt if I had been around my sisters and family and all that, I might be a different person because I would have had some help or something, but I didn't have that. And so I'm thankful for the journey that I've had. I'm thankful for everything. I'm thankful for every pain. I am just thankful. I'm thankful for the mistakes that I made because I can forgive anybody. I don't know how you can make a whole bunch of mistakes and not be able to forgive because I always feel everybody's doing the best they can because I was and look what a mess I made. Well, me, uh, what I have used is some of your sayings and when some of these uh, mass shootings happen and also like with your, your granddaughter, I remember that when there's an example of violence in a family, that sometimes that becomes the go-to as a solution. And you would say sometimes everything, the things that come to you are either a request for love or a gift of love. And when someone hurts another person, I have been thinking about, especially with like the shooting in, I think it was South Carolina with uh, Ruthen. I thought about that there's healing that we need to do in the nation and that that is a person who needs healing. It's a request for love that he's shooting people at. Mm. So I wish that you could speak louder so people could hear what you said. Did you all hear me? No. Yes, yes, I yes, we did. Thank you. We heard her. Yeah. So what I think she said, uh, she Not went, that well. went through the crucifixion of was it George Floyd. Is that Not well, yeah, George Floyd was really difficult to take, but the uh, shooting in South Carolina where the young man, he was a young adult, and he shot uh, the people in the church that were having a class. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you said, you think that was a cry for help? Yes. I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, on um, TED Talks this week, the mother of the boy that did the shooting in Columbine, was on TED Talk. And she was talking about how hard it was for her, her because this young man killed all these people and then he killed himself. And so she was the one that was left and she was the one that the neighbors were mad at. And she was the one that had to bear all the anger that people felt about that. And it was like, She said when after her son had killed himself, when she looked back at his diary, she never looked in his diary, but he was writing all the time about his depression and his anger. And it was just a very hurtful time for her. And I think that I say some things that doesn't make sense to other people, but it's what I feel. I feel that the way you learn to forgive is somebody causes you pain. You don't know how to forgive as long as you just read about it, you know, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I learned the Lord's Prayer, but you don't know what that means until somebody has done something that hurts you. Now that's how you learn forgiveness. You learn that when you have a reason to forgive. So uh, we cling to our physical bodies, but the body is a house we live in. 
and that's not who we are. But in the world we live in, because we live in a physical body, the physical body is more important than the spirit. But that's just the house I live in. And one of these days I won't live here anymore, but I won't be dead. I will live forever. I came from somewhere. I'm stopped by here for a little while, and then I'm going somewhere else. That's how I feel about it. Say amen, Dorothy. <laughs> amen. I think that's the perfect end. Amen. Perfect. I came from somewhere and I'm going back there. <laughs> Bless you, Reverend Eve, for being with us tonight. I want to thank you so much. Can we show our appreciation for Reverend Eve? <laughs> clapping or see everybody clapping out there for you, Reverend Eve. I want you to show your appreciation in your offering to the Church on the Hill. Very good. Uh, that's coming up in just a second. And uh, maybe I'll let you talk about that when we get to that. I just have a few announcements um, that I'd like to run by you. Um, on Peter, you ready, my friend? Here we go. On Sunday, November 22nd, Reverend Jerry Carter will be speaking on God is not motivated if you aren't. <laughs> and that will continue our November theme of living as compassionate conduits. Meditation is at 10 and the service is at 1030. Next Wednesday, November 25th, practitioner Chantal Rolfing speaks on love, loss, and life during the pandemic for our, our Wednesday night service. Meditation is at 6.30 and service is at seven. Well, we, have, we are back in the purple tear in order to stay safe as we shelter in grace and contain the virus. As a result, our, our planned Spirit Treasure Bookstore is canceling the annual plaid holiday clearance sale that we had scheduled. Um, so we'll have it in the spring when we can all get back together again. And next, the Association of Global New Thought is sponsoring Thanksgiving tables from the comfort of your own home. If you want to connect with a group of eight to 10 new thought thinkers on Thanksgiving, check out the Village News tomorrow for details on how to sign up or you can check it out on our events page of our website. If you wanna receive our newsletter, um, for those that are joining us for the first time and haven't, please go to the homepage where you signed in of the oaklandcsl.org. And down on the left-hand side, you can submit your email address and we'll be able to send you our village news every week. Also, don't forget to check out the Oakland for Center Spiritual Living's Village Facebook group, as well as check out our YouTube channel. All of these have hot links on the, on the, on the webpage um, that you can instantly get access. Um, on our YouTube channel, we have Wednesday night services, Sunday night services, special videos um, from different people. So if you're interested and like to watch videos, um, we have quite a few out there on our, our website, on our YouTube channel. Everything that goes on here at the center is everything is centered around the oaklandcsl.org webpage. I encourage you to go explore it. You'll find lots of things there. Tonight, I wanna to thank Constance for hosting us and Sam doing the admitting and Peter on PowerPoint, Alice LaRue on spotlighting and Alice Lorraine helping to mute and manage the sharing. Also wanna thank Zoe with the most important job of pressing that recording button at seven o'clock. But even more important than all of our folks behind scenes is Stacy. Stacy, I want to thank you so much for assisting Reverend E tonight. We really appreciate having you as part of the backup team. So thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. Bless you.
So it's time for our offering. And Reverend E always says to me, Paul, make it a big deal because it's a big deal. So I'm going to let her say a few things. But the one thing I've learned from Reverend E is she says, I love money and money loves me. So I, I remember that. So Reverend E, if you want to just take a second and talk about the art of giving and how it benefits the all of our churches. I'm gonna turn, let you have the spotlight on that for a second. Well, I, I um, money only comes to people who feel deserving of money. And so I took a, a workshop on money and the man said that uh, bring a hundred dollar bill and we were supposed to burn it up. And people were reluctant to burn this money and he said, that's because you don't feel like you're gonna get more. And so we have hidden beliefs about money, but money multiplies itself. Reverend Ike was a, a new thought minister. He lived, I, I don't know if he's still living. He said, money is like a woman. If you don't treat it right, it will leave you. So you <laughs> must love money and you must treat money right. And you just said, mm -hmm, I love money just so that you attract it to you. That's the law of attraction, that you love money and you use it wisely for the benefit of others, not you, you hoard it. There's been people who died and had all kind of money in safes and, and stuff like that. The money is for the circulation and the transformation of the entire planet. Thank you. So Reverend E, I appreciate you narrowing that down for us and, and throwing such an exclamation point. It's so important um, that the center runs on, needs money to run. And so if you're so inclined, I, um, I, I hold up the, the digital donation bowl or contribution bowl right now. And I see lots of money coming in that. So if you'll <laughs> recite with me the affirmation that we have on, on the screen, joyously I give. <laughs> with an attitude of abundance, knowing that as I give, I do receive. So thank you everyone who, if you're, if you're so inclined, please go where everything else is on the website and Peter's showing it right now. There's a nice big donate button up there. And if you click that, it'll you can enter your credit card information. It's safe, it's quick, and it's easy. Um, and that's a great way to donate to the church. We also accept checks in the old fashioned mail way. <laughs> <laughs> so um, more than anything, I think we started our evening tonight on with the, the you know, it's the pre-week before Thanksgiving and everybody is thankful um, for your donations, your time, your treasure. Um, that all of us bring that are on this call tonight and especially to you Reverend E for taking time to come back and support your home and we're grateful co-inhabitants of yes. this state yes. so we love you very much thank you. So thank you so much everyone for joining us and I'm going to ask Reverend E to close us out in prayer okay <laughs> The health risks for well, I, I really would like another practitioner. I started out reading the practitioner's prayer. So I'm, I'm not the only practitioner here. Oh. Another practitioner who feels called to this duty to just step up and do the closing prayer because this, this, this is a community effort here. So do we have a practitioner out there willing to step in for Reverend E as requested for closing prayer? Absolutely. This is Dorothy. Do you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So let us all take one collective deep breath together. As we give thanks for this time that we have spent this Wednesday of November 18th, recognizing and knowing that God is right where each and every one of us is. And we give thanks for what we have learned today. We give thanks for our leaders, Reverend 
Eloise Oliver today who has bring to us the spirit of God and truth. That truth has been revealed to each and every one of us as we have opened our hearts and our minds to receive that which she has to give to us today. And through this service, this Wednesday satsang, we are changed. We have included in our daily living a word that we take with us from this service that enhances our life. Thank you, Reverend Eloise. Thank you for being that vessel that God moves through you as you. And I know that as we leave this Zoom meeting, that God goes before us making any appearance of a crooked road straight. And we give thanks. And until we meet again, may God bless us and keep us in his grace. And together we say, and oh, so it is. Thank you, Dorothy. Oh, wow. Dorothy, the den mother has spoken. <laughs> Turn on your cameras, everyone. We'll say good night to each other for a few minutes. So good to see you all. Hi, Miss Sabrina, <laughs> Lucian, Judith. Dorothy, Hello. Thanks. Happy Thanksgiving to Peace everybody. Blessings. Hi, hi Barbara. Hi. Love Dr. to you all. Joan, hi, hi, Paul. Hi, Judith. Hi. 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 Barbara. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Love yous. Bye bye. Hi, Maury. Hi. Nice to see you. You too. Thank Hi, you guys. Peter. So Hi, everybody. There's a baby, Reverend. Here's <laughs> your baby. There's the baby. Oh, Yay. Yay. Hi, baby. Oh. Hi, Sarah. Hey. Yay. Thank you for sharing the baby with us. It took us yeah. long enough. <laughs> Hi, grandmother. Bye. We love you. Okay. Bye. 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 Oh, give me a baby any day.